Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. I'm your host, Steph Bodrini. This podcast is for everyone who wants to learn about commercial property investing and join our real estate family. We get the best people in the industry to give you straightforward and practical advice that you can actually use in your investing. And in today's episode, we are talking about the tax benefits of investing in real estate. We're chatting with Ted Lanzaro. He has been providing real estate tax strategies for investors for over 30 years. He is a real estate investor himself and has a lot of knowledge into this very, very important field. Here we go. Ted, I am actually so excited to have you here today to talk about the most fun part of the year. First, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Oh, Stephanie, thank you so much for having me on today. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. So I am a real estate investor CPA. I have been for the past 30 years. I run Manzaro CPA, which is a boutique tax strategy firm for real estate investors. We deal with investors all around the country. Um, our clients are, are people who, everybody from people who just have, you know, small portfolios of single family properties all the way up to, you know, syndication companies that are buying, you know, 200 unit apartment buildings, do also do like self storage, mobile home parks, office buildings, shopping centers. So, everything kind of real estate uh, we do tax strategy on. I actually got started doing this. I was working for a CPA firm, started in the real estate department, and I saw how much um, money my clients were making, you know, in real estate. And about the same time, a friend of mine uh, handed me a book. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I think a lot of investors have read that one, and uh, told me, hey, you should, you should read this. We should start investing in real estate. And I said, uh, you know, I, my clients are killing it. I think you're right. You know, and we, we one day we went out, first day we bought, um, we bought three single family rentals in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And that was the beginning of my real estate investing career, about 2000 or so. And uh, we took it up to... Probably about 40, 50 units. We were buying some garden apartments down there and some more single families. And I started flipping houses, which led me to the local real estate investment clubs in the area. And I went to a couple of meetings to network and talk with people. And they found out I was a CPA. And they asked me to do, you know, like a, a tax talk for them. First time, you know, I'm doing it. My knees are clicking together and, uh, basically just reading off a PowerPoint, but I, I got through it and everybody clapped at the end and I walked out there with a few new clients. And I've been doing the exact same thing for like literally the past 20 plus years now on my own and helping them, you know, keep more of their money in their pocket instead of paying it out in taxes. It's awesome that you have been investing in real estate for over two decades and you also do taxes for people. So you must know a lot about that aspect of the world. So why don't we jump into what are some of the benefits of investing in real estate from a tax perspective? The biggest tax benefit of investing in real estate is that you can basically make net income from your investment. So you get your rental income, you pay your insurance and your mortgage interest and your real estate taxes and uh, you know your other expenses and you have money left over right and then you can apply what's called depreciation against the property and depreciation is the rational allocation of the purchase price of the property that you can uh, then deduct on an annual basis and so for residential real estate typically um, a residential apartment building is depreciated over 27 and a half years so let's say, for example, you pay $2,750,000 for an apartment building, you'll get $100,000 of depreciation expense every year. You know, real simple math, um, which means that I could have $100,000 of net cash flow from that building, offset the depreciation and have zero taxable income, right? But I still have $100,000 in my bank account that I get to keep that, doesn't, that I don't have to pay taxes on. That's the benefit of investing in real estate. The other benefit 
is that you can actually leverage your um, investment with debt, right? So um, if you know, if I if I go and buy buy stock, for example, uh, in the stock market, you know, if I want to buy twenty thousand dollars worth of stock, if I have twenty thousand dollars, I can buy twenty thousand dollars worth of stock, right? If I have twenty thousand dollars and I want to buy real estate, I can buy a hundred thousand dollar property, right? And get a mortgage for the other eighty thousand, right? So that gives me the ability to get a return on investment, you know, typically higher than what I could earn. In, in the market, then combine that with the fact that I'm not paying any taxes on it, and it's just a higher uh, return on investment. And I also want to ask you before I ask this question: Does that apply also for people who are not real estate professionals? And within along those lines, can you define what a real estate professional is? Yeah, sure. And so in in this scenario. You don't have to be a real estate professional to get to zero. You can just be an active investor and be able to make this kind of money and not have to pay any taxes on it. So there's three different kinds of investors. There's passive investors, there's active investors, and then there's real estate professionals. And what it has to do with essentially is your ability to deduct rental losses caused by depreciation on the property against your ordinary income, right? So a passive investor is only allowed to deduct um, rental losses against other passive income. Uh, so a passive investor is somebody who either invests in somebody else's deal and doesn't have any control, or they could be active investors who earn more than $150,000 a year at their W-2 job, which is the IRS threshold for um, not being able to deduct rental losses. So a passive investor can only deduct um, losses against other passive income. So the best they can do is get to zero net rental income, right? So in the, in, in the scenario we just laid out where somebody had a $100,000 in cash flow and $100,000 in depreciation, that actually works. That's, so that's a net, net zero scenario. That would be ideal for a passive investor. They would still have that $100,000 in the bank. Now, if I'm an active investor earning less than $150,000 a year, I can actually deduct up to $25,000 of rental loss against my ordinary earned income, right? So take that exact same scenario, that exact same building, but we have a we have $75,000 of cash flow and $100,000 of depreciation, and we have so we have a $25,000 loss. So now, if I was a passive investor, I wouldn't be able to deduct any of that loss that would carry over to the following year to be used. But as an active investor, I can actually use it to offset my earned income from my W-2. So I can take, I used to say I have $100,000 of earned income, my W-2 income, and a $25,000 rental loss, I only pay taxes on $75,000. So I was able to use the depreciation to not only offset all of the income of the building, but also to defer $25,000 of my salary, my earned income. Now we get to, and, and the way you qualify as an active investor is to basically be actively managing your own properties and putting in at least 250 hours a year on these properties. So now, if I'm a real estate professional, I can deduct all my rental losses. I'm not limited to $25,000 a year. I can deduct as much rental losses as I can produce against my ordinary income. If I'm putting at least 750 hours into a real estate related business, brokerage, development, property management, landlording, and it's more than half of what I do. So that's the other caveat. So, if I, so it's very hard for somebody with a W-2 job to qualify as a real estate professional because um, they're working 2,000 hours a year, say, for example. So they would have to have 2001 real, uh, real estate business hours in order to qualify, which is like pretty much next to impossible to do. But if you qualify, like I have a client who's a real estate broker and he had a great year in 2020, he made like a million dollars in real estate commissions, right? So now somewhere in around, you know, June or July, he's like, man, I'm killing it. I'm going to make like a million dollars in commissions this year. What should I do? And I'm like, well, 
you need to go out and buy another apartment building. He's like, why is, why is that? I'm like, well, go out and buy a, a big apartment building and we can, you know, cost segregate it and we can take all of the depreciation against your earned income. So he went out and he found a property. It was about $2 million. He bought it. And he got about $400,000 in bonus depreciation on this property. And we were able to use it to off, because he's a real estate professional, we were able to offset the $400,000 in depreciation against the million dollars that he made. And he only ended up paying tax on $600,000, right? So that's a big difference. That, that $400,000 difference in his bracket was $160,000 in taxes. Not bad. Right? Yeah, not bad, right? <laughs> you know? On top of that, we were then able to take another two hundred thousand dollars and put it away in a in a special kind of retirement plan for for people who are don't have any employees. And he actually only ended up paying tax on four hundred thousand on a million. So he, he deferred four hundred thousand dollars of it with cost segregation depreciation and another two hundred with a retirement plan. That's so awesome. So it was a real. He had a great. We had a great plan for him. We always saved him a lot of money. One that's the power of depreciation and cost segregation. But it's also the power of being proactive about your tax strategies before the end of the year and talking to your CPA during the year about what kind of money you're making, as opposed to him coming to me in March of the following year and said, hey, man, I had a great year. I made a million dollars. What can we do about it? <laughs> Nothing. Not now. So, yeah. so that sort of, you know, that's sort of that difference, right, is whether or not you're, you're, if you're proactive, you can save a lot more money. So I always tell people, you should be calling me whenever you buy, selling, or renovating a building. They need to tell me about it because there's tax strategies that will benefit them that we will implement in each of those scenarios. And there's record keeping stuff that I'm going to want them to do also because record keeping is the foundation of being able to use tax strategies. So when real estate professionals are able to deduct everything and pay no tax, there are some drawbacks. Can you elaborate on what some of those drawbacks can be? Well, there are some drawbacks. The primary one is recapture when they sell the property. So that guy, for example, when he, um, when he goes to sell that property, He's got four hundred thousand dollars of recapture tax, so it's a it's a deferral. It's not an avoidance, right? So you make money with cost segregation on the time value of money because you're going to pay the back money back when you sell the property eventually, unless you do a ten thirty one exchange, right? So in this guy's scenario, I've already warned him that you know, look, somewhere down the road when you sell that property, there's going to be a big capital gain because your cost basis is is a lot lower. So that's the, really the primary one. And that's something that I'm talking with people all the time about because everybody's been using this bonus depreciation, you know, and taking huge offsets against their their earned income, the, the ones that qualify as real estate professionals. And I keep telling them, the Piper is going to come to call one of these days. When you sell that property, let's say, and, and what's going to happen too is, that bonus depreciation is actually set to phase out. So starting in 2023, it goes down from 100% bonus depreciation to 80%, then 60% in 24, 40% in 25, 20% in 26, and then 27 is gone. So the, the strategy now, if you sell a property is, oh, I'll just go buy another. If I can't do a 1031 exchange, I'll go buy another property and just get new cost segregation to wipe out the gain on the property I sold, right? Well, that strategy has got about a, two more years of useful life, and then it's going to become a lot less valuable, and then it's going to be gone. What about the fact that they might not be able to get a personal loan? Does that count as one of the drawbacks? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's – well, look, and here that's, – that's a really good point because – and I was just – you know, it's funny because I was just on the phone with a guy before we got on our call, and I was telling him, and it's the exact same scenario, which is – Good tax strategy and good asset protection don't always correspond with good financing, <laughs> right? You know, and sometimes you can take so many tax deductions that you can't get a loan. Now, typically, banks will add back depreciation. It's not a cash flow issue. It's a it's it's sort of a you know allocation of the purchase price, but 
you know, I've, I've seen people have problems with fine, you know, getting financing. So there's always that fine line between getting the next deal done and maximizing the tax benefits. And because I have clients that want to deduct everything, right? You know, like how do I deduct this? How do I deduct that? And that's all well and good. And a lot of times you can find good rational explanation for, for deducting things. But then always understand and, 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 and know that, you know, the banks are looking at that. And if it reduces your cash flow, then that may be something that prevents you from getting that next loan, especially with the sort of um, debt coverage ratios that a lot of banks are putting in place these days. Exactly. And that's something that is very important that not a lot of people talk about. No, no. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, they only find out when they're trying to get a loan for a primary residence or a secondary. So <laughs> people need yeah. to. Yeah, no, and that's, and that's true. That's exactly right. Like, well, how are you paying this loan back? You don't make any money, right? Why? Because <laughs> I'm deducting everything, both hands. So along those same lines, how would you recommend a real estate professional paying themselves with an LLC? If you have your rental properties in an LLC, right, there's no difference if you're between being active and being a real estate professional. It's your money. If you own the property, you take the money out as a, as a draw from the LLC. Being a real estate professional doesn't make you have to take the money out a different way than an active investor would, right? It's the exact same thing. The only, it's only a classification that allows you to take losses. But what it means is I'm already working in the real estate business. Therefore, the tax code has afforded me certain benefits that other people don't get. And then if they're trying to refinance that property and they're paying themselves, how would that look from a bank's perspective? The bank should be expecting you to take your profit out, right? Because it's not, you're not, it doesn't reduce your net income. So if I have if I if I have a hundred thousand if I run a rental property and I have a hundred thousand dollars in my LLC and I take it out as draws, right? It's not an expense against that net income. Now the bank may say, "Well, where's that hundred thousand dollars that you made?" And you say, "Well, you know, I paid my bills with it, right?" So they may not like that you took the that you took all of the cash flow out. They may even have cash flow reserve requirements and that sort of thing. But out, um, outside of the reserve requirements, the money is yours. Take it. That's what. That's the whole point of being in that business, right? Yeah, exactly. And as they say, you know, the tax laws are made so that people behave in the way that the government wants you to behave. So if it is for you to maintain and build real estate, great. It's available to every single person and whoever wants should take advantage of it. No, that's true. That's right. It's, it's, it's The tax code definitely incentivizes, incentivizes behavior, for sure. So let's clarify a few things about deductions. Personal business expenses should be under your personal income because that will not look good on the business expense. Is that correct? Or it does not make any difference? Well... Look, the more personal, we we're just talking about trying to get a loan, right? Financing. The more personal expenses. So I'm a big believer in allocating, trying to allocate as much personal expense, thing I'm, things I'm already paying for already, and trying to convert them into business expenses, right? So as an example, taking, um, taking uh, I want to go to dinner, so I go to dinner with a client. Right. You know, I feel like going out to a nice restaurant, I'll take a client with me. That way I'm able to deduct the dinner. Most of that is legitimate. If you have a legitimate purpose, business purpose for it, it's a legitimate expense. And I'm all for taking those expenses now. But the more you do that, the less likely it is that you're going to have the kind of net income that is going to want, make a bank want to loan you money. So that's when we're talking about balancing that stuff out. That's what we're really talking about because I've seen people want to, like I said, try to deduct every personal expense they can. They literally want to deduct every meal they eat, right? And I'm like, well, yeah. no, you have to have a business purpose for it. And if you're going for a loan, you know, the fact that you've got 
you know, you're running a rental property and you've got ten thousand dollars worth of meals and and you know, meals and entertainment expense on it, you know, it just doesn't look good, right? It doesn't look right to the bank. I can make an argument for somebody who's doing that, who's running like who's like the marketing person for a CPA firm or, uh, you know, a financial advisor or real estate broker who's taking out clients and stuff. You've got to watch the kind of personal expenses you take because some of them are going to be kind of normal expenses and some of them are going to be over and above. And while you can make a legit argument about the business usage of them, you may not be able to get a loan if you take too many of them. Exactly. Wow, this has been so great. Is there anything else that you think is important for our listeners to know? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think just from a just from a uh, tax standpoint, you always want to make sure that you're keeping good records and that you're telling your accountant what you're doing during the year. I think that's the most important thing. Because being proactive about reaching out to your accountant and letting them know, hey, I'm buying a property, I'm selling a property, those things are going to make a big difference in what can be done to help you save money on taxes. And I just think it's the most good record keeping and being proactive are the two most important things for saving money. So, guys, this podcast is being released in September 2021. It's time to call them right now <laughs> to plan your year and... Uh, purchase anything that you might need to purchase. Ted, thank you so much for joining us today. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Yeah, no, Stephanie, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. They can go to my website at www.lanzarocpa.com and get more information about my practice and there's a work with Ted. Um, you can also reach me at my office at 203-922-1742 or email me at ted at lanzarocpa.com. And you have also done um, a webinar on tax uh, benefits and things like that. So I'll make sure to put that under show notes as well, along with uh, your contact info. Thank you so much, Ted, for making the time to join us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at MonteCarloREI.com and I will see you next time.